So we're going to move to uh, from the global environment to the Scottish environment. Uh, uh, Colin Mahaffey, Head of Digital Media with National Trust for Scotland, and Stuart Cruikshank, the Client Services Director for Storm ID, are going to give us a case study on Bannockburn. Uh, and the, the, the line that's used is aligning strategic business vision to user-centered design, which I think was the actual battle cry on Bannockburn. OK, welcome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm Colin Mahaffey. I'm head of digital media at the National Trust for Scotland. And down there is Stuart Cruikshank. He's the director of client services at Storm ID. Um, it's lovely to share a stage with such great, great people. I mean, when I told my mum earlier this week I was doing a talk and Google were going to be on before, she said, oh, I know Google. They make the internet. So um, well done. Uh, terrific. Good work there. So what am we going to talk to you about today? Um, if we just get a clicker here. So, well, really, all we can do is tell you our story. It's a story about how, for a particular project, for the Battle of Bannockburn project, our approach, our strategic approach, married with Storm ID, who provided the end product to produce a winning solution for us. We've seen some really amazing technology today. And I think it's really important that we contextualize it a little bit. Um, and just coming back, we're going to talk more about the method and the thinking behind your digital projects. It's very easy, in a way, to jump on the latest singer, jump on the latest band, bandwagon, or my neighbor has this, my, my next door neighbor has this, so I have to have that. And what I want is to rewind just a little bit, because there are lots of great tools out there, but we've got to think about how we use them. One thing I would say to you, I'm not going to cover social strategy. I'm not covering content strategy, nothing like that. We're going to focus on one project and particular elements of it, and hopefully you can take something away from that. So first of all, quick show of hands, how many people know what the Black Battle of Bannockburn was as a historic event? Good, most of you. Some people don't. It's the bit at the end of Braveheart, the battle at the end. <laughs> so it's not the one with the freedom speech. That was the Battle of Stirling Bridge. So what I'll do is I'll take you through a 90-second run-through of what the visitor center is and what it does. Um, it came about in around about 2011. You'll recognize much of what you see here because this is the Battle of Bannockburn Memorial Battlefield that we at the National Trust for Scotland operate, the famous statue. And the Scottish government, in alignment with the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, funded a brand new visitor center. It replaced a very tired old visitor center, and it used 3D imagery to create a brand new type of visitor experience. What that included was a notion of agency. Agency is learning through doing. So kids, everyone, they come through, they encounter and find out about what went on in the battle. And as a result, they then end up in the battle room, where they actually take part in the battle. And we worked with the uh, Glasgow School of Art Digital Design Studio on it. So it was really a cutting edge experience. One of the other things that we do is we created interactive character stations as well, so that people could actually interact with the characters previous to the battle. One of the things I mentioned about this, it was such a big partnership, it was such a wide partnership, that we actually had a very, very wide remit with it. So we had to, in a way, if you like, satisfy lots of different people. So how did we approach this? Because what you saw there was fine, that was, well, that's 2014 it launched, but we had to, way before we'd seen any of that, develop a project for it, and that's the National Trust for Scotland. We have a singular approach to digital projects, and this approach comes around one very, very simple thing. It comes from a guy called Richard Rummelt. He wrote a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. I really recommend you have a look at it. And strategy doesn't need to involve consultants. It doesn't need to involve lots and lots of work. This approach that we take to all of our digital projects, it can work for a Facebook page or it can work for a multi-million pound ticket and website. I can honestly say that. Three steps to it. You identify the challenge and define the objective of the project or the piece of work you're doing. Establish core principles and then create coherent actions. The bit in the middle, the principles, is a bit that often throws people but the principles can be the things that your organization are about, and they're really important to remember. 
So what were the challenges at Bannockburn? Let's look at them. It was a new type of experience replacing the old one. Really, really interesting, but we had to flatten a visitor center. There was nothing there for 12 months. And then during that period, people were turning up from all over the world, literally, um, and going to the battlefield, but no visitor center. They just saw a building site. So over that 18 month period, we had to do something to fill that gap. It was limited capacity and it had timed entry. So essentially what we had there, there was only 30 people for each battle experience. And the last thing we need are queues and queues of kids crying because they can't get in. The other big challenge we had, it was National Trust for Scotland members expect to just turn up and walk in. We've got 330,000 members, not all turned up at once, thankfully, but they expect to turn up and just walk straight in. So that was difficult as well. And then we had a high education remit. So we were funded by the Scottish Government and the Heritage Lottery Fund. So they said to us, well, right at the centre of it needs to be what you're doing to deliver the story of the Battle of Bannockburn. It's national curriculum. We had to follow that. And here, this picture is a shop dummy, Robert the Bruce, which inhabited the previous visitor centre. So from there, from looking at the challenges, like I say, looking at challenges can be a 10-minute process, it can be a three-week, four-week process, and for us it was longer. We had to define the objective for the Battle of Bannockburn, and that's all it was. So much of what we do, we can complicate it, and we can make it difficult for ourselves. But with Bannockburn, we boiled it down to an objective we carry across many of our projects, and that was to deliver quality message and monetary conversion through digital channels. It makes a lot of sense. Beneath that, you can have all the KPIs you want. You can have all the sub-objectives you want, but you've got to be very clear on your objectives. I have to say, from a personal point of view, working for years and years in this industry, the easiest bit to do is to get wowed by something or jump into something and forget about why you're doing it. Robin mentioned it right at the start. It's about making solutions work for the consumer and work for you. We also need to establish a core principle for Bannockburn. So as this project was going on, what was the principle that was driving behind it? We've identified the objective. How do we deliver it? For us, it was really simple. Put the website user first. So the website user is not the visitor. Let's be totally clear here. The website user is the person who is visiting your website. They become a visitor, if you're lucky. So don't make the assumption that the website user is a visitor. There's Half the people in this room who know this already, maybe some others are thinking, well, whatever, but it's a really, really important thing. You're not building resources, digital resources, for the chief exec or for the cleaner. You're building them for the website user, and that's a really, really important thing. Some other people have principles along the line, but, well, we have conservation principles, we have financial sustainability principles, but those are the sort of things you must look at. And in our case, I've illustrated this with uh, the greatest chief exec of all time, Robert the Bruce, as against some customers. Now, just to be absolutely clear, they are not peasants, okay? And so they, these are customers on the other side. But between the business needs and the customer needs, we find UX, user experience. We find really great, meaningful experiences, okay? And that sweet spot is where you've got to be in a digital sense. Some of the stuff the guys from Google were doing, the EGO stuff, it's terrific. And that helps you to get there. It enables you to get to that point where meaningful transactions take place. So having looked at the principles, we've defined the objective, we've looked at the principles, we define coherent actions. And these are some of the tools that we use at the National Trust for Scotland to help us come up with coherent actions. So looking at some of these, I'll take a quick buzz through, grab me afterwards, chat to me about them, or tell me about the ones you use. That would be even better. Forrester, is not, they have free online resources for project prioritization and profiling. Very, very good. Google Analytics. Again, they made the internet, so they know how it works. Gartner have a terrific tool called the Hype Cycle, which is, some of you may have come across it, but it's, it actually trends what technology is being used in different industries across a given time scale. It helps you work out what your customers might use and when. Wolfram Alpha, another big organization, they have a Facebook, a Facebook profile tool that's actually very useful, and they've got lots of resources as well. And YouGov, some of you might know where that's, YouGov have a profiler, so YouGov carry out tens of thousands of surveys. And as part of that, they profile people, go into it, type in 
It might not be your organization's name, it might be one that you can identify with, and it produces this profile of what the customer will do or what they'll be like. It's more fun than fundamental, um, but it's accurate, scurly, so it'll tell you about media, TV programs they watch, things like that. Really great free tool, again. So having used that, we've gone through the process of identifying challenges, we've got our objective, we've got our principles in place, and this seems lengthy and chunky. Could be an hour long you've spent doing this. You get some actions together, and there's ours. Visitor experience web resource. We needed to do that. We needed to have a visitor experience web resource which was adaptable and we grew over the 18 months of the project. We needed an integrated online and front of house ticketing solution which would also satisfy paying and non-paying visitors. The very clear message, the very clear activity that came out of that was that non-paying people had to use the same checkout as the paying, as the paying people. We needed our members to book online, otherwise we'd have visitor crush. And finally, an online learning resource. So we needed an interactive and innovative and very hard-working online learning resource which would achieve government objectives. There was a lot of money given to us. We had a responsibility. So having done all that, we pulled together a tender document. And like I say, in some cases, you could use this and have something executed and operational inside an R. But that's where Storm ID came into it. And Stuart's going to explain to you some of the principles and some of the methods of user-centered design which helped the guys to deliver a winning solution for us. Thanks, Colin. Well, this was a fantastic brief for um, the Storm ID. Really enjoyable project to work on. Um, so we, we've been developing a, a process at Storm called user-centered design. You may have heard of this. And what I want to talk about is, is talk through the process that we followed at Bannockburn. But what I also want to do is break down the process into three key principles that any of you could take away. And no matter what the budget you have, these three principles can be applied to any project. Before I talk through the process and the details, it would be worth defining what we mean by user-centered design. So this is a process by which the, the expectations and the needs of end users are given extensive consideration at every stage. So to put it simply, this is meeting the expectations and the needs of end users. So, first key principle, start with user needs. Now, you're going to have challenges with this because everyone in your organization is going to have an opinion. And um, what we found at Bannockburn was absolutely critical, was getting all the key stakeholders into workshops at the start and really putting the user front and center. We walk through who the key audiences are, who the priority audiences are against the business objectives, and got buy-in from all the stakeholders on what the kind of key priorities are for the user. And in, within an organization, you're going to make assumptions about what your user needs are. But to really find out what the users actually need, you need to speak to the users. And that's what we did. So we identified about five different user groups. So this is an example here of teaching. Senga, she's a teacher. Uh, so these are, one of, these are user personas that we created for each of these five different audiences. And these are a couple of tools that you can actually do yourself. You don't need to be an ex uh, expert researcher to go out and speak to users. So we asked t uh, the audience, like Senga, what is she looking for? What does she need on the website? And on the right-hand side, this is a tool called Empathy Mapping. And you can actually do this yourself. You can download this tool from Google, and you can ask your users, what are they seeing? What are they doing? What do they feel? And how do they think when they access your resource? And this all builds really, really valuable context around your users and how they, what they expect before they come to your resource. Now, once we've got this kind of background context about the user, the next stage is identifying the user needs. And this is absolutely critical. This is fundamental to the whole process. So this statement here is a user need. So for Senga, who represents our teaching audience, that's her user need. That's one of her user needs. Now, you might have, say, five user needs per user. So once you define the key, the key statements of intent, you can then design the user journeys around these users. 
And this then informs the content, it informs the functionality, and it informs the design. So it actually drives the whole process. And this was particularly insightful for the teaching audience, because we'd made various assumptions around what the teachers and pupils would want from this. But what the teachers told us was they wanted uh, their own dedicated resource where they could go, go in and download teaching materials. So we went down the path of actually creating a dedicated resource for teachers. And what teachers also told us about pupils was that they learn in a completely different way. They're much more advanced now. And Terry, Terry, Terry will be pleased about this. They they're just use Google, basically. They use Google and Wikipedia. And they learn in a much more informal way. So they weren't interested in downloadable PDFs. They wanted interactive resource. They wanted to be able to access it on their mobile phone, on tablets. So borrowing from Wikipedia, we created a Battlepedia. And this, is a, this allows pupils to go in and explore the characters, the weaponry uh, around the battle using 3D images and actually create their own stories around the battle. So definitely encourage you to try and build in user research at the start of any project. The second key principle I want to talk about is be content-led. This is a famous quote here, content Design in the, co in the absence of content is not design, it's decoration. So the user needs, as I said earlier, they define the content, and then the content should define the design, not the other way around. So there was some talk earlier from Nick about storytelling and, uh, and the importance of, of content and storytelling. And this was very front of mind. We had, a, we had a objective, as Colin set out, to inform the audience around the transformation that was happening in the Manic Burn and to tell the story. So we pushed very hard to create a unique tone of voice for the Battle of Bannockburn that, that was very, very different from the corporate style of the National Trust. Also key to this was using the 3D imagery that Colin mentioned was created for the interpretation. And unlike some of yourselves, you may have access to great photography for your properties. We didn't have that access, but we turned this to an advantage and used the 3D images uh, that were available for the interpretation. And then that then informed the design. So as you can see the final outcome, the, the 3D images and the unique style were very, very much the hero. And designing without the absence, without the absence of those, would have been, um, the end result would have been very, very different. The third key principle I'd like to talk about is adopt an agile approach. This is a project management terminology, but to put it simply, it means testing often with users. At StormID, we do things a little bit differently in terms of testing. Testing is normally something that's done at the end of a process. We actually do it at the start, and we do it throughout the process. This is an example of a sketch that a user put together, which is actually remarkably similar to the end homepage. So from the very start of the process, we were going out, speaking to audiences, and asking them to sketch out what they were looking for. Then as we went through the process, we started, we wireframed, went out again to speak to users. And this process was particularly effective in terms of getting the ticketing flow right. As Colin mentioned, there was a bit of complexity around that within the paying and non-paying customers. So we've developed customer flows, user journeys, across a range of different device sizes, such as desktop, tablet, and mobile, speaking to users throughout the process. So in summary, held workshops with stakeholders to get buy-in on the process, follow, uh, follow an agile methodology, speaking to users at all time, develop the content before the design, and then when it all comes together, test with users again. And of course, all this is driving traffic to the center itself. So Colin's going to come back and explain about some of the results from the project. Um, as you all know, it's all about results, and these were the results. These are where we are to date. In 2014, we had 66,000 visitors. To put that in context, it was, in context, it was triple the volume of the previous centre, which was way above, above what we expected. One of the things with members was 43% of them booked their trip in advance. So it's a really interesting thing. It's not costing them anything, and we had a real concern about them just not turning up and having no obligation. Good people that they are. I don't know how many of you are members, but good people they are. They actually turned up, holy speaking. Less than 2.5% on a free ticket failed to turn up. 
and this organizational fear dissipated. And the ones who don't turn up tell you in advance, so that was terrific. We've had over 6,500 school kids through, and the Battlepedia resource, which we can show you outside, that averages nine pages a visit. We put, thanks to the fantastic analytic tools we have, we can follow school kids around the, the, uh, the Battlepedia and see how they're interacting with it. And they are, they're creating their own Battle of Bannockburn. So like I say, a very different approach from us. We want to tell you about our story, about how we came to do what we do. But as a client side person, if you like, it's a really important thing to remember that not everything is beyond your reach and it's sometimes so, so important just to take that step back, take a deep breath and look at your process and look at your approach because we don't get it right all the time, that's for sure. But the more often we do that, the better the results will be. Thanks very much for your time.